This is Patrick Hart Ministries Young Catholics Respond, brought to you by Viva Guadalupe. Now, here's your host, Bill Snyder. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Young Catholics Respond on Patchwork Heart Radio. I'm your host, Bill Snyder, and on this episode, I am so blessed to be joined by Brian Kemper. He is the Youth Outreach Director for Priests for Life. Brian, thank you so much for being here with me. Oh, absolutely. It's an honor to be on. So uh, I want to talk with you a little bit about uh, how you first got involved in the pro-life movement. Well, um, I I come from... Uh, a family that that wasn't religious at all. I was uh, not a Christian growing up. Um, I grew up uh, around California, mostly in the Los Angeles area. Uh, ended up, uh, you know, dropping out of high school, heavy drug addict, um, and I ended up overdosing and almost dying at a Grateful Dead Bob Dylan concert in 1987. Mm. And uh, it was a doctor in the hospital who shared the Lord with me and. Uh, a week later is when I uh, got clean, which is uh, just about 30 years to this week. Wow. Congratulations. 30 years, 30 years. off uh, crystal meth and uh, LSD and cocaine and all that. So um, and then uh, started getting involved in churches and um, really uh, I, I went. It was a week after uh, I uh, came to this church that I went to a, a Christian uh, punk rock concert and uh, <laughs> And it was uh, a band called The Crucified. And there was a few other bands, Vengeance, Deliverance, and uh, Cross. But Crucified, I, I was drawn to one of their, their T-shirts. Um, and it was a, um, um, a demon choking out. And, and it said Gal 220 on it. And I was like, what's Gal 220? So I went <laughs> up I went up to the, the booth and... Uh, the the drummer's girlfriend now his wife uh, I, I still know the band to to this day and still talk to them um, but the drummer who was I think they were still in high school at the time uh, was go well, she kind of laughed and she said well that's Galatians two twenty and and I was like okay what's that and uh, she was talking about how it says for I have been crucified with Christ I no longer live but Christ lives within me. Mm. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. So I, I bought the T-shirt. I immediately bought the T-shirt. Yeah. And then the band started singing this song called The Silent Scream. And I was just blown away by what I was hearing. And I went back to the table. And she started to talk to me about abortion and what it was. And the song was talking about the silent scream of the baby inside the womb. And... I was just like, wow. And so I, I, I got the uh, the cassette tape back. Uh, if people even know what a ca- cassette tape is. Um, yeah. And I remember walking around with my walk band listening to that song over and over. And it really uh, it really had intrigued me because even, you know, back in my earlier days and my drug days, a friend had asked me for money for for an abortion. And I was yeah. like, I, I don't know how I feel like I, I didn't care much that he did it but i didn't want to give money to it right but i just didn't care that it, i mean i didn't say anything about him doing you know his getting his girlfriend an abortion but now it was like really intriguing to me yeah and so i was going to a church back then um this was long before i came back to the catholic church uh, but i was going to this church called sanctuary which had been started by the band Striper, if uh, you remember the old Christian rock band. They were like the first big Christian rock band that got you know okay. huge. And um, and there was a girl at that church who would give me a ride every Sunday and tell me stories about this thing called Operation Rescue and how she was involved in that. And I was just absolutely like, wow, this is really cool. And one day I, I went to uh, a men's prayer breakfast and I was with another band and they were like, hey, we're going to go to this Operation Rescue event. Mm-hmm. And it was in downtown Los Angeles and there was a couple thousand people and there was over 500 pro-abortion protesters and they were they would walk up and just say the most vile things about Christ into the ears of the moms and the kids that were there trying to get them to leave and they had a woman who was topless on a cross and it was just, it kind of blew my mind. And, uh, I think it really hit me as like, wow, this is, this is something I should get involved with. And, uh, 
I started going to the rescue events. I was arrested many times for praying in front of the abortion mills. And um, I found out that uh, Jeff White, who ran Operation Rescue West, who now runs Survivors of the Abortion Holocaust, a youth yeah. pro-life outreach, he was going to start a, a missionary program. So I said, all right, I'm going to do one year of pro-life work. Because I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to sing in a <laughs> Christian punk and rock band and all of that. And I was just like, that's what I'm going to do. I love music and I love reaching yeah. people. Mm-hmm. And so I started my one year. And um, one day I was in downtown Los Angeles. And uh, I used to go into the abortion mills undercover. And we would call this a truth team. And the girl would go in. And she would ask for a pregnancy test, and I would sit in the lobby and read the magazines, but I was secretly putting pro-life literature into all the pages of the magazines. Mm. And um, we had done this where uh, we had had some crazy experiences two different times. The girl that I went in with a lot, she was 14 years old. Her parents were good friends of mine. This, This was a virgin, never even kissed a boy in her life. But she would go in and ask for a pregnancy test. Two separate occasions, they actually walked out and said, oh, yes, you're pregnant. <laughs> and this was, again, a girl who's never even kissed a boy in her life. They showed us a positive pregnancy test. And they said, give us, you know, first of all, I'm in my 20s. She's obviously young, 14. Yeah. They should have been calling the police is what they should have been right, doing. Right. But they'd say, uh, give us $250 and we'll do the abortion real quick and no one will ever know. And th- this is the abortion industry. This is like a normal thing. And we were blown away. But this one day uh, she went in and uh, she went back And this. This was a clinic that was uh, in downtown Los Angeles, mostly geared towards illegal immigrants. So they got us in fast because we were, you know, Caucasian. And there's 20 or so girls in the lobby, another 20 in the hallway. And we were she went back there, but she was taking a long time. And I thought, oh, no, she got caught because what she would do. Is she would sneak into the abortion room and put pro-life literature under the pillow or different places for the girls to see it. And I was getting really worried. So I walked up to the counter and um, that moment changed my life. At that very moment, the door to the abortion room opened. And wow. I looked in and there was a young woman, probably about 16 years old. Her head turned towards me, tears pouring out of her eyes and her legs up in the air. And I witnessed a human being murdered in front of me and a young woman probably emotionally damaged for the rest of her life. And it hit me at that moment. This is not just something I can do for a year. This is not just something that we can say we're against. I watched a person killed. And uh, I remember going home that night and I just was crying out to God in the shower and I heard an audible voice say, Brian, save my children. Beautiful. And uh, that was in 1993. Beautiful. And uh, since that day, I have dedicated my life to ending the abortion holocaust. And that's, that's why I do what I do. Well, that is incredible. Um, and um, just tell us maybe a little bit how you got involved with Priest for Life. You said you uh, reverted back to the Catholic Church yeah. as well. Well, at that at that time, I had started an organization called Rock for Life. Um, I used the Christian rock bands that I was into to get the pro-life message out. Um, I did a, a, a secular concert tour. It was a huge concert tour, 20,000 people at every stop called Lollapalooza. Yep. And uh, they had invited me to have a pro-life booth on that tour. Wow. And so some of my friends, they, all they said is you could have a booth. There was no support or anything. So a few of us... Got, uh, we had one friend who uh, rented us a car for a month. Uh, we went to different pro-life organizations who donated literature to us. And uh, we started touring with Lollapalooza. And uh, we were you know, sleeping in the car at night. But we were, we were able to reach like 20,000 kids a day. Um, and then I started doing that. And, I, and then I got on a television show called Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher. Okay. Did uh, five episodes of that show, which really blew up the, the, the organization, obviously. Yeah. Um, I even had the lead singer of Van Halen uh, at that time call me up and wanted to get involved with us. Like, it was, it was amazing. It's awesome. And then uh, as the years went by, 
um, getting involved with the pro-life movement, obviously the, the Catholic church is such a, a, a cornerstone of that movement. Yes. Um, starting to realize, you know, there can't be 20,000 truths, you know? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> and, uh, I actually, it was funny as, as a, my, one of my best friends, um, he owns a, a Christian t-shirt company called one truth clothing. It's mm. not Catholic, no. but it just said one truth. And I remember I was, I was looking in the mirror one night. And I'd been struggling and struggling, and I was looking at my shirt, and over and over, I just keep saying one truth. Yeah. And I just knew at that moment, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's only one truth. And I remember I went right after that to uh, Belgium to speak at the March for Life Belgium. I was with uh, Joe Scheidler's son, Eric Scheidler. Yes. And we were in the back of a car. And we were driving to to an event there, and I looked at him. I said, "Hey, can we pray the Rosary?" And his jaw almost hit the ground, <laughs> like he had been him and Monica Miller and so many had been yes. trying to. Monica Miller, she's she's a bless her heart. She is she tried for years to convert me back to the church, and, <laughs> but I I went to confession there, and I came. I had you know grown up when I was little. I had gone to you know first communion, done all of that, yeah, and yeah. then my family didn't follow through with anything, right. so. I just I, I remember being there and just saying I I have to come back to the church I want to go to mass I want to take communion, and the 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 monsignor there took me under his wing and made it all happen and the next day they had a special mass for me and all my friends there, and uh, awesome. I stood up and and said the creed and and uh, was able to take communion again. That's awesome. And so from there it was uh, it was I had, you know I Father Frank. For years, him and I had a relationship where I'd be at an events, pro-life events or the March for Life, and we'd sit down and he'd, he'd, I'd ask him questions about the Catholic Church. Yeah. And he would give me answers, but not in a way where he was trying to just pound it into me. He was just answering my questions. And yeah. th- right before that trip to Belgium, I actually <clears throat> was sitting at a table. I spoke at a conference. I was sitting at a table with Father Frank, Abby Johnson, and Teresa Tamio. Well, and, there's an all-star team for you, right? <laughs> and uh, Teresa, man, she was just on fire answering my questions. And that was the, the day, like two days before I went to Belgium. And so yeah. when I got back and when I converted to the church, um, I called Father Frank. And one of the things I had told him for years, I said, you got you to gotta spruce up the youth outreach at Priest for Life. Yep, yep. And that pretty much uh, coming back to the church, he, he him and Janet Morana were just like, well, here we go. Now's the time to do it. And they brought me on board. That's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, well, you know, we have to take a short break here, Brian. Believe it or not, it's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, 13 minutes flies by so quickly. Wow. <laughs> I know, doesn't it? Um, but we're going to take a break. And when we come back from the other on the other side of this thing, uh, we all want to talk to you about, you know, why young people need to be pro-life and, you, okay. know, we'll, you know, all that. So we'll do that on the other side of this break. I'm Bill Snyder, right back after these messages on Young Catholics Respond. Our Blessed Mother wants only the best for her children and has given us a special place where she promises to help all those who appeal to her motherly love and protection. Telling Saint Juan Diego that here I will alleviate the sufferings of all those who love me and seek my protection. That holy place is now the site of the beautiful Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City. If you would like to learn more about how you can visit this special place of grace, please visit vivaguadalupe.org for more information. Our Lady may be calling you now. Do you want to keep your finger on the pulse of Patchwork Heart Ministry? Follow our monthly blog, Written on Our Hearts. Simply go to patchworkheartministry.blogspot.com and click subscribe and follow the on-screen instructions. That's patchworkheartministry.blogspot.com, then click subscribe. This is Martha Fernandez Sardina with your Love Minute, brought to you by RememberYouAreLove.com. Do you know what children crave the most today? They crave love, and that translates into time. They are looking for you. A priest once said from his experience, when people are on their deathbed, they don't say, I wish I would have spent more time at the office. What they many times regret is not having spent more time playing with their children. Do you want to love your children well? Do you want to teach them how to get love and give love? Spend quality time with them. Spend quantity time with them. 
play with them, listen to them, talk to them, show them how much you love them, and also spend time with God so that you, with your Father, may fill up your love tank. For more on love, find us at facebook.com slash remember you are loved. And remember, you are loved. Now back to Young Catholics Respond. Once again, Bill Snyder. Hey everybody, welcome back to this episode of Young Catholics Respond here on Patchwork Heart Radio. I'm Bill Snyder. Uh, today joining me on this episode of Young Catholics Respond is Brian Kemper. He's the Youth Outreach Director for Priests for Life. Um, a great organization does incredible work and uh, Brian's testimony that he gave in the first half of this uh, his journey and uh, to pro-life and all this stuff is just incredible um, but I, I want to shift the focus in the second half of our interview for Brian to what is going on with this youth culture and why young people should be pro-life in today's in today's culture well you know I, I actually believe a lot of them are I uh, I, I could tell you that um you know, the, the media, the secular media, obviously, um, wants to paint this picture that everybody's just just completely liberal and, and, and such. But um, I can tell you from my experiences going back to the early days of Rock for Life, when I was telling you about the tour with Lollapalooza, yeah. the um, the first day of that we joined the tour was in Dallas, Texas, and uh, we were setting up our booth. It was before any of the... the kids would come into the concert yeah. it was just bands in the in the nonprofits. yeah and this guy skateboarded up to my booth and he's like i'm gonna pee on you and i'm like excuse me <laughs> uh, let me introduce myself and i said I, my name is brian and he goes well i'm billy joe armstrong from green day and he was the lead singer yeah, of green yeah, day yeah 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 and he's like you don't have a right to your opinion blah 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 and i'm like well i dare you to take me on stage in front of everybody and debate me it's like I'm not doing that. But he went up on stage and he took some of our literature and he tried to he tried to burn it. It wouldn't burn. He ripped it up and he told the crowd to go beat us up and destroy our booth. Now, we had literally driven all the way to Dallas. We were, had nowhere to stay the night before. We had six dollars left to our name. We didn't know how we were going to eat. <laughs> Jeez. And but we were there. Yeah. The, the girls from our our group that were with us, the two girls, got threatened in the bathroom by a, a feminist pro abortion band called L Seven. We were there and all of a sudden billy joe tells the crowd go destroy their booth and beat them up wow and so this crowd comes around and all of a sudden you hear people going well i kind of agree with them wait a minute that's ridiculous they're just standing up for life by the time that crowd left there was over 200 dollars in donations and mm -hmm. people telling us yeah we kind of agree with you they look at the pictures of the babies and go that's wrong yeah and 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 we were just like Wow. And over the years, that's I, I wear a pro-life T-shirt almost everywhere I go, especially airplanes and busy places. I love to do it. And you would not believe how many people come up to me and go, I love your T-shirt. Thank you for your taking sure. your stand. And, and over the years, this is what I've seen. I have a lot of friends, um, you know, that are not Christian in any way that sure. wear my stuff that ask me. Um, I get bands even uh, there's a bands that aren't christian that come up hey i'll wear that t-shirt on stage you know sure um i have a friend who's she's a lesbian but she wears our abortion as homicide hoodie <laughs> like she's like don't kill babies like it's just it's wrong and so you know going and, and i remember like going to the march for life in 1994 was my first year yeah and it was about 70 percent older people you know i say that as i'm Today's my 50th birthday. <laughs> well, happy birthday, <laughs> by the way. Uh, it was 70% older people. But uh, there wasn't a lot of ways for young people to know. Like, I would I would go and go to different music festivals or different places and tell people about Rock for Life. And they go, you mean there's other kids like us? Like, it wasn't – the internet wasn't really around, yeah. you know, you, a little bit. You know, you had, like – uh, America Online, or you yeah, know, right, right, the the original stuff. But as as social media and the internet and all this stuff, it, it people started to realize how how it is. If you go to the March for Life now, it's like seventy percent young people, yeah. and we're talking hundreds of thousands. There's a, there's a story about um, I believe it was the head of NARAL, National Abortion Rights Action League, who got off the train in Washington D.C. Yep, on the day of the March for Life. And she flipped out 
because all she saw were young people carrying pro-life signs and wearing pro-life T-shirts. And she went to where the, 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 the pro-abortion yeah. meeting was, and there was like 20 older women. <laughs> Isn't that, that was it. Same thing. I went to Belgium. Uh, they had a pro-abortion march the day before, and it was just a bunch of senior citizens. And then the pro-life march was young people. I do believe this generation is pro-life. I'm wearing it. I wear a shirt all the time that says, I am the generation that will abolish abortion. I believe that's going to happen. I do truly believe that's going to happen because I see that. Young people are understanding the importance of standing up for human life and standing up against uh, the, the killing of innocent human life. I mean, the whole social justice movement that has that has enthralled this generation sure. We, I wrote a book called Social Justice Begins in the Womb, and I'm teaching them that that's a big part of this social justice movement is standing up for all human life. Yeah. And, and I'm seeing that spread. I'm seeing that spread quite a bit. Well, and that's, and that's beautiful because, uh, you know, human life, according to the Catholic Church, begins at conception and ends with natural death. And uh, that, is, that is what we believe as Catholics. It's, it's part of who we are. Um, and you know uh my my own personal journey you know of of faith and and life would 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 say that uh too uh you know brian this you know these these issues are you know so important to get out there and publicize because as you hinted at earlier the the mainstream media will not talk mm-hmm. about the hundreds of thousands of you know young people that are at this march for life they will talk about the 25 older women that are in an abortion meeting i mean that's what they're doing and so you know um how how do young people find other young people because because they're you know they're being kind of misled out there oh absolutely i think i think social media is as a parent of teenagers i hate it <laughs> but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. I've embraced it because I know how to use it to reach people. Um, it's one of those almost necessary evils, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know. Yep. But um, uh, which abortion is not and is never a necessary evil. No. Uh, but it's interesting because you say that, that um, you know, obviously the Catholic Church says that life begins at conception, from conception to natural death. Yeah. And, and you could parallel the, 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 the church's teaching and scientific facts so perfectly. Um, obviously, we, we know that when, when the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary, yep. she went to go visit her cousin Elizabeth. Yes. And most scholars will say it took about seven or eight days for her to reach Elizabeth. Yes. So, we also know from that that whole that section of, of scripture that um, it says that Mary waited. Excuse me. Um, three more months after that, for John the Baptist to be born, so that right. puts John the Baptist at the fetal stage at six months. Sure. In the womb. Yep. Which, if Mary took about seven or eight days, that puts Christ at the zygote stage. Probably about halfway down the fallopian tube, ready to implant in the uterine wall. Mm -hmm. So you could take that whole section of scripture and show the scientific biology of what Christ was, where he was in his human development. Yes. And where John the Baptist was in his because because they go, well, it's just a fetus. Well, John the Baptist was just a fetus. Right. That leapt in the womb at the presence of Christ, who was just a zygote. Yeah. There you go. You know, yeah. it, it's just such uh, the mm. the, uh, the the science of it is, is so clear there in the Bible. Um, and, and I think people it's funny because people always go, well, I, I believe in science over the Bible. I'm like, well, you can back up everything in science with the Bible. <laughs> right. You know, uh, you talk about how sins are thrown as far as the east is from the west, knowing that if if you go east and west on a globe, it's an infinite distance. The right. opposite of north and south where you hit points. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the, the Bible is full of science and it's and I think you can take that and it's just a beautiful way of, of showing people when life begins that that the Catholic Church, their teaching is not just about religion. It's about science. Yeah. And that's and that's beautiful. And the more and more science comes to back up this, I think the more and more uh, young people will will. Because, you know, the one thing that I, you know, have encountered in, in my youth work with young people is that they're always looking for a, 
a you know some type of proof. They're always looking they for that. Facts. They, they want, want facts. Yeah, they want to see facts. it now. They want to see it now. And and and, and if you can deliver that that oh, to yeah. them, they they have very little reason not to trust you or not or not because well, back you up. They still think. Right. So many old people they don't they just they get set in their ways. Young people still think. They want to yeah. they want to think things through. Believe me, I have teenagers. Mm-hmm. They, they'll question me on every turn. Yeah. But it's like if you could show them a simple thing like I'll ask them, well, "When do you stop growing and developing?" They're like, "Oh, I'm not sure." I'm like, "Well, the day you die." Mm-hmm. So think about, it. you know, the older you get, the, the bigger your nose gets and your ears get that you you parts of your body grow and develop until the day you die. Yeah. And they're like, "Okay." So let's take that backwards. Tell me when that started. And and they look back and I go, I go, it's obvious. <laughs> it started the moment the sperm and the egg united to create a unique human person, 23X, 23Y chromosome, that DNA there, a separate DNA from the parent. It started at that moment, at that very single moment, everything started to happen. So if if life development ends here, and begins here, then no matter what name you put on it, zygote, embryo, fetus, infant, toddler, teen, adult, senior citizen, those are all just names of the stage of the life development that you're in as you continue and grow. Yeah. And it's such a just like, duh moment. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's it like, is. that's a life. That's a human life. It's, it's not a potential human person. Since when have you heard about a, 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 a fetus suddenly becoming an ostrich? Right. Like, there's no, it's a human being. Right. And they, it's such, and I think it's such obviousness to, to, to these young people. They're like, yeah, that's, that's a human being. And I'm like, when is it okay to kill another human? Never. 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 And it's, I go, look at what's going on in our world. Look at what's going on in our world with all this death and hatred. Don't you think it's time for some love and compassion yeah. and life? And I'll tell you, they they agree with that a lot of the time. Uh, I, yeah, I I've seen it too. And uh, let, I, I've got like two minutes left. Unfortunately, these things just fly by. Um, I want to just maybe ask you in those two minutes just to tell young people uh, how they can get in touch with you, how they can reach Absolutely. you know Priest for Life and um, and and you PriestForLife.org dot org and StandTrue dot com are our two main websites. Um, please get in touch with us if you want literature, resources to do reports in school, uh, all the information you need so you can maybe, let's say if your teacher gives you a argumentative project, we can help you with that. we got great pro-life T-shirts, all this different stuff you can need. If you just need someone to talk to, just give us a call, uh, email us. We'd love to uh, help you uh, expand your, your pro-life outreach as a young person. Awesome, and that's just a very simple priestforlife.org. Uh, what was the other website? StandTrue.com. StandTrue.com. That's another great website. So uh, kids, teens, young adults, college people, uh, visit that website, um, StandTrue.com, and, uh, you know, visit it all and, and check it out. This is an amazing organization. They do so much good for life. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for being here. Awesome. Thank you. Well, this has been an episode of Young Catholics Respond on Patchwork Heart Radio. Until next time, from all of us here at at Patchwork Heart Ministry, keep beating to your Catholic heart. This has been an episode of Young Catholics Respond. For more information about this program or Patchwork Heart Ministry, visit patchworkheart.org. That's patchworkheart.org. Or email info at patchworkheart.org. The words spoken by Our Lady of Guadalupe to Juan Diego nearly 500 years ago are almost too good to be true. Asking that a temple be built at the site of her apparition, she promised that here I will give all my love, my compassion, my help, and my protection to all those who love me, cry to me, seek me, and who have confidence in me. Here I will listen to their weepings and alleviate all their sufferings, necessities, and misfortunes. My name is Alan Napleton and I live in Dallas, Texas. I have visited her shrine in Mexico City dozens of times, bringing my own petitions and have found Our Lady to be true to her word. Over the years, I have brought hundreds of pilgrims to this holy place without incidents and have now founded Viva Guadalupe, a nonprofit that provides safe and inexpensive pilgrimages to Our Lady's Shrine. If you would like to take Our Blessed Mother up on her promise and learn more about how you can visit this special place of grace, please visit vivaguadalupe.org for more information.